First, thanks for the introduction. I'm Zui from University of Maryland. And today I'm going to talk about our recent work on automatic feature engineering. And uh, this work was done by me and my advisor tutor. So malware detection has been studied for a long time, but it's still an unsolved problem. I think something wrong with the color. Um, so the task is to identify the malicious files from benign. And in recent years, uh, machine learning has been widely used in detecting malware because, uh, because machine learning is able to detect those unseen malware based on how similar they are to those known malware. And the key of machine learning is the feature engineering, which is a process of using domain knowledge to create features. For example, uh, in the early years, uh, people were using permissions to, to detect the Android malware because permissions is used to protect the sensitive data and functionality, so it should be useful in detecting the malware. But later we found that permission is only the privilege, so it does not show any actual malware behaviors. And also for those malwares which exploit the privilege escalation vulnerability, this, uh, the permissions may not work. So people start using API methods to detect the malware because they can reveal more detailed malware behaviors. But in security community, we know that malware keeps evolving, so we will see uh, more and more new behaviors. So for example, in the early years, um, Android malware may more focus on short message service, so they will send text message to, uh, to the premium rate numbers. And later we found that uh, they will also access our sensitive information, like our phone number and uh, our locations. And more recently we found that malware will also target our user interface, like create some transparent layer. And as a result, so uh, more and more people are talking about security nowadays, and we have more papers. And for example, uh, this year, CCS accepts uh, 137 papers. And not only the number of papers, we will, also have, uh, we will also have more new concepts and new terminologies. So for example, um, this figure shows the count of unique words from Oakland papers. So such an increasing trend suggests that uh, people are likely to talk about different things. So here comes the problem. The domain knowledge is increasing, but on the other hand, the domain knowledge is the requirement for the feature engineering. So here we would like to ask, can we engineer features automatically from security literature? And before answering this question, let's first look at how human engineer features. So Drabin is an Android malware detection system. It consists of over 500,000 Southern features and from eight different categories, including the permissions and suspicious API calls. It has a good experimental performance. It can achieve 94% true positive with only 1% false positive. And so compared with its prior work, which only uses permissions as the features, Drabin has a much better performance. So people are wondering why your system works and uh, what is the meaning of your features? So this is how they explain it. So on the right hand side is some examples from their uh, suspicious API calls. And they select get device ID and get subscriber ID because they could be used to access sensitive data. And they select get, uh, execute HTTP request because it could be used to communicate over network. And for the last one, runtime.execute, it could be used to execute some external commands. So it seems that there is a hidden layer, which is malware behaviors. So the manual feature engineering process is actually a process to link the features to the real malware behaviors. However, this process has its limitations. So it requires intensive manual effort. Uh, for example, Drabin has only uh, 315 suspicious API calls, but the total number is over 20,000. And also, it requires the human knowledge. So in order to do the feature engineering, we have to be really familiar with various malicious behaviors. So 
as an alternative solution, people start using some uh, automatic data-driven feature selection techniques. So this topic has been widely studied in the community of machine learning and statistics. So I'm not going to put too many words on this topic now. But when we apply these techniques to security, we will also have some problems. So the first problem is the semantic gap. So basically, we don't know, uh, we don't know the meaning of each feature. And even though they have a good performance, we don't know why the system works. And the second problem is the data quality problem. So in the security community, we know that it's, it's hard to collect a super clean data set. And we will also show this problem later in our evaluation part. And the third problem is some uncommon patterns. So those automatic feature selection techniques will consider these uncommon patterns as the noise, so we will ignore them. But in security, we know that these patterns are also very important because they are related to the real malware. So this data-driven approach can partially solve uh, the limitation of manual feature engineering, but it, it will also introduce some other problems. Then let's go back to the first question we have. Can we engineer features automatically from security literature? And from the previous discussion, it seems that we should have some additional goals, like using the automatically engineered features, we should have a good experimental performance on detecting the real malware. And unlike the data-driven feature selection techniques, we would like to provide the explanation for each feature, and we would like to have a better coverage of the malicious behaviors, for example, those uncommon patterns. And besides, we think that uh, it will be pretty cool if we can even rank the features according to, the, according to their relevance to the malware. So let's introduce our system, FeatureSmith, which addresses all these goals. So here is the outline of today's talk. We will first uh, talk about two key techniques used in FeatureSmith, and then we will go over the uh, detailed system design, and in the evaluation part, we will see how useful our features are. So the first technique is called behavior extraction. So as I said earlier, so the feature engineering process is to link the feature to the real malware behavior. So the first thing we need is the behavior, which is a basic description of malware activity. For example, like access sensitive data and execute external commands. And we define such behavior to be some short phrases which consist of subject, verb, and object. And we can find this uh, relation by using the Stanford dependency parser. So here is an example. The ZSO malware is designed to send SMS messages to certain premium numbers, which will cause financial loss to the infected users. So the first step, we do part of speech tagging. So we know which word is the verb, which word is the noun. And then we can use the Stanford parser. We know uh, which word depends on another word. And you have already seen it in, the, in previous, uh, previous presentation. And then from the dependency type, we can further extract uh, subject, verb, object relations. So in this case, we will have five different behaviors. For example, ZSO malware send SMS message, ZSO malware send to premium numbers, and uh, premium numbers cause financial loss, something like this. So by doing this uh, behavior extraction, we are able to decompose a really long sentence into several short descriptions with a single meaning. And the second technique we use is called semantic network. So after we extract all these behaviors, we have to understand what is the meaning of the behaviors. So for example, this sentence, um, API calls for accessing sensitive data, such as get device ID. So when human reads this sentence, we know that get device ID could be a good feature for detecting the malware, because human knows that attacker would like to access sensitive data. But machine does not. Machine does not know that this behavior is related to the malware. So our goal is to identify which behaviors are malware related. So our solution is the semantic network, which is usually used to measure the semantic similarity between two concepts. So it consists of nodes and edges. The nodes are some basic concepts, which are usually the words or the phrases in the sentence. And edge represents the semantic similarity between two concepts, which is usually measured by the frequency of collocation. 
So for example, this one malware is designed to send SMS messages to premium numbers. So we find that this one and send SMS message appears in the same sentence. So we can infer that they are related. And more, and more often, these two concepts appear in close contacts. More likely, these two concepts are strongly related. So this is the basic assumption of semantic network. And by using the semantic network, we are able to learn which behaviors are more likely to be related to malware. Then let's go to the si system design. Then let's first look at our corpus. So we collect papers from three security conferences, and we also collect some articles using Google Scholar with the keyword Android malware. And in total, we have 1,000 papers. We also collect 280 malware names. And this is just the malware names. Uh, FeatureSmith does not need any actual malware samples. And for the features, we focus on permissions, API methods, and intents. So for the features, they can be extracted from Android documents. So this is the architecture of the FeatureSmith system. So after we extract the behaviors, we further filter and assign an initial score to the behaviors. So such, beha such weight is used to uh, describe how likely those behaviors are related to, the, to Android. And then our semantic network consists of three components, features, behaviors, and malware. Then we use our corpus again to compute the collocation between the malware and behaviors, as well as the collocation between the behaviors and the features. And then the next step is the feature inference. So we start from the malware. We learn which behaviors are more likely to be related to malware. And then from those suspicious behavior, we learn what is the feature candidates for detecting the malware. So here is an example. This is a part of our semantic network. So from the corpus, we are able to learn which concepts are related. And then we start from the malware. We assign them an initial score to all the malwares we have. And then we propagate this score to the related behaviors. So in this case, send SMS message is more likely to be related to malware, but identify execution path is not. And then we further propagate this score to all related features. And then we further use this score to rank our features. So the last, so the last step is the feature explanation. So for the explanation, we output all the related behaviors as well as the source sentences where we can find those behaviors. So as a result, uh, we find 195 features using FeatureSmith system. And here, this table lists the top five features uh, suggested by FeatureSmith. And we can see from this table, this, all these top five features are quite related to the malware activity. For example, uh, the malware can register for boot completed so that they know when the, mal when the system finishes booting. So they can start their background service using OnStart. And the malware with send SMS permission could use send text message to subscribe the premium rate service. And the malware with receive SMS permission could even block the incoming uh, text message. Then let's go to our evaluation part. So in this part, we would like to answer three questions. The first one is, are the, are the features useful? So to evaluate this, we collect the real malware samples from Drabin and VirusTotal. And we have equal number of malicious and benign apps, and we select two-thirds of them as the training set and the rest as the testing set. And we train three different uh, classifiers using random forest. And the first one, we use all the features from FeatureSmith. And for the second one, we only use the top 10 features from FeatureSmith. And for the last one, we use all the features from Drabin. So here is the rock curve of our classifiers. And for the rock curve, this top left point corresponds to the ideal performance. And from this figure, we can see that uh, both the classifier has, uh, have the equivalent performance, and we can both achieve 92.5 true, uh, true positive with only 1% false positive. And it shows that our, sorry, 
It shows that our uh, automatically engineered features are useful in detecting malware. And our feature set, our automatically engineered feature set, is as good as Rabin, which is deliberately compiled by human researchers. And after we zoomed out, we found that even if we just use the top 10 features from FeatureSmith, the performance is not bad compared to the prior work. So this means that our ranking mechanism also works. But for, but for ranking, we will show it later. Then let's look at our 1% false positives. So we have 18 uh, false positives in total. And uh, we found actually eight of them are suspicious which means that we can find at least one detection from virus total. So for our experiment, we just uh, use the labeling from Drabin. So, so we have this, uh, we found, and we, we found this. And this might be because that uh, these apps were identified as malicious after the Drabin paper was published. So we think that the real false positive should be even lower. And on the other hand, it also shows the data quality problem. So in the security community, we know that it's hard to collect a clean data set, and uh, driving ground truth is not an exception. And for the, rest of, for the rest of the apps, we found two security apps which can intercept the incoming phone calls and, and filter the spam messages. And we also find one supervision app which can uh, track the locations of your children. And we also find one banking app so for these four apps, it's really hard to, just in, terms of, just in terms of their behaviors, it's very hard to distinguish them from the malicious apps. Then let's go to our second question. How good is the ranking? So to evaluate this, we use mutual information, which captures the uncertainty of malicious, maliciousness given one feature. So uh, it means that a higher mutual information uh, a higher mutual information means that the features are more useful in detecting the malware for our, for our malware samples. And uh, for our feature smith system, we rank the features using the score propagated from the suspicious behavior. And to compar uh, for comparison, we use term frequency as another literature-based ranking mechanism. So this figure shows the cumulative mutual information for two ranking mechanisms. And we can see that the curve for feature smith is always above the curve of uh, term frequency based ranking, which means that feature smith is able to assign those features with high mutual information a high rank. Then let's look at the uh, top features ordered by mutual information. So these top features are the most useful features in detecting malware for our malware samples. So let's look at our feature smith ranking. So feature smith is also able to assign the high rank to those uh, for these five features. And we further performed the ranking correlation test, and we found that the p-value of feature smith is less than 0.05, which means that the ranking by feature smith is related to the ranking by mutual information. But this is not true for term frequency-based ranking. So the last question we would like to ask is, what is the benefit from using feature smith? So the first benefit is, is uh, feature smith is able to fill the semantic gap. So our feature explanation covers both the basic functionality and, and the malware behavior. So for example, uh, for record audio, we know that it could be used to record audio and also record phone conversation. And for uh, key background processes, we know that it can be used to close uh, other third party apps and for uh, boot completed, we know that some, uh, some malware use it to bootstrap its background service. And here is another example, get natural operator name. So we can find that the related behaviors are uh, sent to malicious server and read natural operator name. And we can also find uh, corresponding reference where we can find these uh, behaviors. So for the human analyst, they can read this both the reference and the behavior so that, so that they can decide whether to use this feature or not. And the second benefit is the, is the new features. So FeatureSmith is able to identify some overlooked feature from manual feature engineering. 
For example, feature smith identifies some over overlooked feature from Drabin. For example, these three uh, API methods, get sim operator name, get network operator name, and get country. So in the Drabin paper, they said uh, their system does not have a good performance on Gaposim malware family because they are, uh, they are the downloaders, so they didn't expose many malware behaviors. But we also found that actually many apps from this family also access the personal information using this overlooked API methods. So we think that one possible reason for this false negatives in Drabin might be this overlooked features. And uh, compared to the data driven uh, feature selection, our uh, feature submit system can also identify some overlooked signature. So by using the, sig by using the signature, we mean that uh, it's related some behavior related to the attack, but because they are not very common in the malware samples, so they are not they are not helpful in increasing the precision and recall. But since they are related to malware, so they should be also very important. So the first case is uh, feature smith is able to identify some uncommon attack patterns. For example, uh, Zitmo extracts the phone number of message sender using the following API methods. And feature smith is able to identify them, but when we go over our malware samples, we found that actually this uh, attack pattern is not common in our malware samples. And the second case is some alternative implementations. So for example, if the attacker would like to know when the users changes their location, so they can use on location changed. And we found that some paper pointed out that instead of using on location changed, we can use on NMEA received instead. So, and the same thing, we, when we go over our malware samples, this, this API method is also not used very often. And the third case is some potential threats. So uh, we found one paper designs a side channel attack using its music active to infer the user's location. So for this side channel attack, we cannot find it uh, in our malware samples, but we think but because it is a potential threat, so we think that it's still important. So in conclusion, we propose, uh, in this work, we propose a method for representing the knowledge for security, which can discover the open-ended set of malware behaviors discussed in natural language documents. And because of our three-layer semantic network, uh, which can capture the meaning of the growing body of the security concepts. And uh, this, this technique is uh, more broadly applicable to various security documents or the uh, security problems. For example, uh, in this work, we only focus on Android, so we focus on the, focus on the API, met uh, API method, uh, permissions, and intents. But if we are interested in network activity, we can, we can change these features to be the URL and maybe IP address. And if we are interested in Windows, Windows malware, and we can, we can uh, add another feature, which is the registry key. So, uh, so our feature smith, so our technique can easily be applied to some other areas. And in our experiments, we show that, um, show that the benefits the benefits of semantic understanding of the malware behaviors. And by using the feature smiths, we can, we can identify those most informative features, and which, uh, which leads to a good performance for the malware detection. And we can also identify some overlooked feature by malware, uh, by the manual feature engineering, and also over identify some uh, uncommon patterns. And, uh, and we also, we will also release our semantic network. Uh, and we think that, we hope that uh, this will stimulate the further research on this uh, semantic aware, semantic aware security. And for more information, you can visit our website, featuresmiths.org. And uh, thanks for your patient listening. I'm Zuyin from University of Maryland Cybersecurity Center. And I'm happy to answer your questions.